Welcome to today's webinar, Ethics and Compliance in the Supply Chain with our corporate member, Michael Page and our Ethics Committee Chair. I'm Monique Fennec from Australasian Supply Chain Institute. And before we introduce our keynote, I'd like to run through some housekeeping for the webinar. Firstly, a technical check to ensure that everyone can hear me. Raise your hand if you can hear me. Speaking of raising hands, as you can see on our screen, uh, it is National Volunteer Week this week and to celebrate our volunteer board of directors and committees, we're working on a special link LinkedIn post, which will include photos of our members and a smiley face drawn, drawn on their hand. So if you could please participate in that effort, that will be much appreciated. If you are having any technical troubles, please send us a chat message in the chat box and we'll help you out there. We will be awarding one CPD point to attendees from today's webinar. Just type CPD into the Q&A box so that we know you require a point to go towards your registration or certification maintenance. The webinar is recorded and will be uploaded to the ASCII Resources Library for members tomorrow and a closed LinkedIn group post will be created for further discussions with our keynotes after today's webinar to continue the discussion. Now, there will be some polls run today, so they are anonymous. Participate as much as you can so that we can share the results with you straight away. And the Q&A section is not anonymous. Instead, it allows for you to post some questions and at the end, we have a fantastic session um, with APCO joining us um, to talk some more about um, some of the 2025 targets. We'd love some of your questions for that session. So to kickstart the webinar, may I introduce our co-host for today, Barbara Schles. Barbara is Manager Supply Chain and Logistics for Michael Page. Barbara has transferred from the Michael Page Netherlands office where she was also working within the supply chain and logistics sector. She's been working with large retailers, FMCG, logistics and healthcare organisations, and her added value is not only to place a candidate, but to act as an advisor. She actively engages with her clients to understand their needs, share market knowledge, help to define job descriptions, and interact with both HR and line management. She's been working for over four years at Michael Page now. I'll ask you now to unmute yourself, Barbara, and welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Monique. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My objective for the next couple of minutes is to give you a brief overview of the trends in recruitment, both before and during COVID-19, and more specifically, where the similarities are and what we currently see as a new trend. Before COVID, we could see a strong change in the requirements from candidates. They were not just looking for a job with a salary, but they were keen to get more flexibility. Flexibility. Think about working from home, arrive after rush hour and leave early to pick up the kids. Long holidays and travel breaks were requested more. People like to have freedom, like to have more freedom and flexibility, which also comes back in terms of daily commute. Some of you might have flexible processes in place. And for some companies, this might not be possible due to the nature of the business. One of the major trends in Europe over the last two years is in regards to secondary benefits, especially starters and millennials. We're always looking at how can I get the most expensive car with the most features? They might not need it at all for their commute, but they were really keen on status. And what we've really seen um, change is their priorities. The change that we see is that people are now uh, preferring to get a basic car and spend the rest of the money or invest it with family, friends, travel, holidays. Now, this is, of course, generally speaking, and is not applicable for everyone. Um, it might also be a bit more related to the millennials. What is currently happening and what is affecting most of us is companies asking people to hand in salary. Some are working three to four days. Others are still working five days with a reduced salary. What we've also seen last week is C-level members handing in salary, for example, the CEO of Uber. Harvard recently published an article about hiring, COVID, uh, hiring during COVID. And what really got my interest in this article is the concern that there is at the moment at sea level. A lot of companies don't have a choice to let people go, but management is still concerning about the skills that they are losing and will need on the short term. Now, one of the questions that pop up in my mind is, does that mean they will need to hire a lot of contractors once the workload increases again? And also the talent pool is not only changing, it is expanding at the same time. And talent is always open for new opportunities. Now, I've only touched a few points, but of course the full article is available. The outcomes and the advice in the article suggest that it might be a good time to restart hiring soon. And with that in mind, I would like to ask you the following question. And I see the poll just popped up on the screen. Thank you, Monique. Uh, I believe you can only select one answer. So I would ask you to select the one that you feel most comfortable with. What do you think will change after COVID-19? Are companies looking for more flexible work in terms of remote working? Are more companies bring the manufacturing to Australia? Do you think salaries will decrease due to the unemployment rate? Or maybe the opposite, where salaries will increase due to the high number of vacancies? Or the last option, which says uh, nothing will change. I'm curious to hear your opinion. So that is really interesting. I'm just getting up the results on my screen and um, I hope you can all see them as well, that the majority says companies will be more flexible in regards to working from home. Um, and then second and third in place, it is the salaries will decrease uh, due to unemployment rate. And um, also the manufacturing that comes to Australia, uh, that will be, yeah, that's one of the things I also thought about as well that probably has to do with cost saving um, and also being less dependent, of course, on the other countries. Um, Monique, um, thank you so much. 
Yeah, Thank of you. course. Thank you, Barbara. Now to introduce the ASCII Ethics Committee Chair, Tim Proust. Tim is a logistics management professional with over 20 years in import, export, warehousing and domestic freight management. He has considerable experience managing sales administration teams and process quality initiatives and is currently National Logistics Manager at Toshiba Australia. As Ethics Committee Chair for ASCII, Tim oversees the Code of Ethics as well as the Ethics Management Program, which is a complaint reporting procedure. Welcome, Tim, and I'll now ask you to unmute yourself. Thank you, Monique, uh, and hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I hope that you're all safe and well and that your supply chains are seeking some of the opportunities that COVID-19 presents. I know for a fact that we are in Toshiba, though we've come across, obviously, a number of fairly serious um, challenges as well to keep ourselves in business, but that seems to be pretty common. You may know, or you may not know, that supply chain management, despite its complexity and seniority within the organisation, is not a profession in Australia, or in fact anywhere in the world. We at ASCII, as the accreditation body for supply chain management, are the not-for-profit organisation pioneering the mission so that our members can have a seat at the board table. Through this representation, we're confident that will translate to a better customer experience. The framework for, for a professional accreditation scheme includes three committees of which contribute to an overall professional accreditation body for members. There's a technical committee, the ethics committee of which I'm the chair, as Monique said, and the industry risk committee. On a practical level, that means our members register as one of the three pillars of supply chain management, operations, logistics, or procurement or ILS if they are defence personnel, and thereafter can register as a professional supply chain manager. How do we become eligible for registration? Uh, by equipping ourselves with global best practice, end-to-end -end supply chain knowledge. And certification is a great option to brush up on your knowledge. Now is the time to study with ASCII. I think in front of you, you'll see a slide there that kind of encapsulates and summarises the plan source make deliver return scenario and underneath there we have the different accreditations that are available with ASCII. So which certification is right for you? Uh, this map lets you decide based on where you sit in the end-to-end -end supply chain. You can see many acronyms, but over time, these become familiar as you begin to take notice of the experts in your network who have obtained some of these designations. While you can choose, thanks Monique, while you can choose, and here's the three pillars that we just mentioned before. While you can choose to self-study APIX certifications, they come with a platform of digital resources as well as textbooks. You can also choose a hybrid solution which is self-study and our online certification review evening classes, which commenced in July. Um, you can scan the QR code with your phone's camera to subscribe to the information pack for updates on pricing and scheduling. If you are watching the recorded version of this webinar or wait to receive the link to the information pack if you have registered to this live webinar. Um, I think this slide here Sorry, Monique. I was going to say this slide here really encapsulate, encapsulates very nicely how the different or the three pillars work and what broad subject matters they cover. I just, I really like this one myself. Um, so it's definitely worth looking at that. I think that's on the um, website, isn't it, Monique? Yeah, that's right. The uh, yep. QR code will scan the information pack and that has demonstration uh, versions of each of the certifications as well as their um, flyers and costings. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Um, introducing Duncan Grucock. Uh, Duncan 
has over 16 years of experience in managing or management consulting, business process redesign and solution implementations. Duncan is an expert in product sourcing, PLM and supply chain management solutions. At EV Cargo Technology, he leads the Asia Pacific team and is responsible for all elements of the business and customer experience. Business development, solution design and delivery, account management and PL accountability. EV Cargo Technology works with retailers to monitor their supply chain networks and design, build, test and deploy optimum supply chain management systems for each organization's individual needs. They work to improve business processes through connecting the entire trading community, giving a platform to thrive by efficiently collaborating with external partners and managing the complex supply chain with full transparency, efficiency and cost effectiveness. With over 25 years experience in delivering supply chain intelligence, EV Cargo Technology has a global client base spanning across America, Europe, South Africa and Australasia. For more information, visit www.evcargotech.com, EV Cargo Tech being one word. Um, and welcome, Duncan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Um, yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so uh, I'm actually uh, an English guy, as you can tell from my uh, accent. Um, I'm based uh, over here in Hong Kong, overlooking, for those of you who have traveled to Hong Kong, I'm overlooking the harbor from the Kowloon side. Uh, we're based in uh, Kowloon Bay. Uh, fortunately, we have quite a sunny day here in Hong Kong. I think those in Melbourne might be a bit cold uh, at the moment. Um, and talking about Melbourne, we actually were down um, in November last year in the, in, in the times pre-COVID, pre-coronavirus, when we were able to travel. Uh, and we met some of the ASCII Melbourne members um, on, on site then, which was great. Um, for those of you who joined that session, um, there'll be some similar themes in this uh, presentation. But we do have some new collateral and a new case study from Marks and Spencers, for example, to talk through. Um, for those um, who are, are Sydney based or based in other areas of Australia, thank you so much for spending the time to, to listen in during your, your lunch breaks. I really, really appreciate that. Um, just before I move into the, the presentation, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, my first kind of experience in the, in the topics we're, we're talking about um, were with uh, UK retailers actually, so Sainsbury's, uh, we work pretty closely with them over here and in both packaging optimization and packaging compliance, we had a project uh, with Sainsbury's to help them um, engage with all their factories and vendors around, uh, around Asia. Um, and also from an ethical uh, trading perspective, we also help them a little bit um, manage their, record their factories, manage their factory audits and record um, who they're using in their supply chain um, and record who they actually were buying from and who they were shipping from. Okay, so let me move down. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay on the uh, transition there. Let's try again. Okay. Great, so I have about um, 25 minutes to talk through um, the agenda here. So I'll just do a really, really quick uh, skim through of who we are, because it's already been introduced. Um, set the scene on why we're picking ethics and compliance in the supply chain. I think all of you will probably know the answer to that already, but we'll just pick out some key statistics uh, and key uh, information in the, in the market at the moment and talk about that. Um, in terms of common problems and industry concerns, I just want to share um, what our customers uh, and potential customers are, are worried about and how they're tackling some of the concerns. So where, wherever possible, I'm just going to try and use examples from around the global retail industry. So we'll show you some of the, the customers that we're working with in this space. Um, and I'm really just going to be sharing some insights uh, from them. And hopefully it will be of interest to uh, to the ASCII members and you may be able to apply some of the themes and topics that we're going to talk about in, in your roles uh, in, in the supply chain. So specifically we're going to look at um, packaging optimization, uh, compliance and technology um, and I'm going to talk through a, a simple case study uh, from Marks and Spencer that we did recently that talks about their journey in, in this space 
I've got some stats to, to share with you because generally people like to see stats around benefits and improvements. Um, and then I'm going to finish on some comments around ethical trade and, and, and what some of the our customer base are doing in that space as well. Okay, so I'll probably uh, skip skip through this slide. Uh, it's been covered in the intro, but rest assured, yeah, we're, we're based here in Hong Kong, um, cover Australia and New Zealand, South Africa, UK, and that's why I'm going to pick different um, examples from those uh, those those markets for you. Um, so more specifically, I'm just going to show you some of the brands that we have worked with or are working with. Uh, I hope that's okay. I'm not trying to show off or um, name drop the brands, but at least you'll understand where where the content and collateral is coming from and where the thinking is coming from. So you know, just really, really quickly, all of you will obviously recognize these brands. Uh, in Australia, we've been helping Bunnings um, with their ethical ethical sourcing. So Bunnings raise orders in, in our system and they also record um, all the factories that are being used and, and whether they've been audited ethically or not. That's something that we can support from a system perspective. Um, the, we're also working with, as I said in the introduction, I've worked with uh, Sainsbury's in, in, in some detail in, in, in packaging uh, optimization and ethical trade. Um, from a, a carton uh, improvement, carton optimization perspective, we've had uh, projects with Primark, uh, M&S and ASOS and Morrisons in the UK. Um, and at the moment, we're working uh, with, with Ralph Lauren, who, uh, who used Hong Kong as their uh, origin consolidation base. So we're working with Ralph Lauren to, to help them reduce their carbon footprint and carton uh, uh, usage. Uh, we also have a project uh, kicking off with the warehouse group in New Zealand um, at the moment as well in a similar space. So there's a, f a fair few brands there you might recognize that we've worked with, and that's where a lot of this, this content is gonna be uh, coming from. So just really quickly, why are we talking about these topics today? Um, you, you would have all, all read about in the newspaper, on the internet, I'm sure your, um, um, your inbox is, is cluttered with, uh, with, with messages around this space, but just as a quick reminder, of how important it is to, to us and our industry. Um, we've got uh, Jane from APCO joining the, uh, the webinar later. Obviously, through the, um, the co-regulated framework, there's, there's targets that um, Australian retailers uh, and brands are, are looking to work towards you know, in conjunction with the government. So there are targets there that, that, that everyone is aspiring to, including you know, looking at how packaging is used and looking at making it more recyclable and reducing the overall amount used. Um, we'll talk more about these topics uh, later in the presentation and how, 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 how you can consider implementing various processes to reduce that footprint. Um, in the middle section there, I think we all know about the environmental footprint. Um, we all know about these massive container ships coming into, into Melbourne port on a regular basis, for example, uh, and the um, amount of um, uh, chemicals that get uh, pumped into the air to drive those container ships. Um, on the right hand side there, it, it, it's, it's still interesting to, to discuss with retailers the amount of space that is still shipped. So that could be in a inner carton, it could be in an outer carton, it could be you know, a, a stat on a pallet, or it could be the overall container itself. So rolling up all of those, uh, all that empty space right the way up to container size. We, we, we do still notice a, a lot of empty space being, um, being shipped. And therefore, huge opportunity to, to improve the, um, the overall statistics and reduce the amount of uh, car, uh, uh, cardboard shipped in the supply chain and the amount of empty space that's moved. So as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll deep dive into some of these areas um, later on in the presentation. Um, and then as a sort of a, a second theme or second strand to this presentation, just want to also touch on ethical sourcing and the, the in continued focus on, on ethics in the supply chain. Um, we, we, we like to use the, um, the transparency index as a way of, of, of seeing how confident retailers and brands are declaring the actual source of uh, their products uh, and, 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 more, and details around where it was made and how it was made. Um, and we, we're kind of monitoring that. So still, we're only really at 40% of global brands disclosing where the actual um, um, garments or, or, or hardline products were actually made. Um, and that's still a, a pretty low figure. And that's not really, um, if you look at the bottom um, section of the slide, it's not really answering the market needs. So 
millennials were, were talked about earlier in this presentation and definitely I think everyone would know that consumers have changing priorities and changing values so they're very interested in knowing you know, where exactly their, their, their shoes come from, their dress comes from, their t-shirts. They want to know where it was made, where the toys were made and how they were made and ensuring and having some confidence they were made in the, the best possible way of factories that have the best possible standards at high quality, but, but also um, with workforces who are, are looked after. So, I'm going to basically deep dive into two of the themes in a bit more detail. So I'm going to start with, with packaging and, and, and cover some common problems and, and concerns. Um, again, um, some of this might be very, very obvious to, to many of the, the ASCII members who ever have walked through a, uh, a factory, whether it's uh, maybe in, in Bangladesh or in Shenzhen or in even perhaps some parts of Australia. I assume the standards are, are, are fairly higher in, in Australia, but certainly this sort of image is not unusual where we are in, in Asia Pacific and where a lot of your sourcing is, is I assume, still, um, still completed from. So um, I'm going to show you this image, which is a what I would call a, a carton horror movie image. We'll show you a different movie image later of, of beautifully packed cartons, but this is like the carton horror story. Um, and you can see there's all sorts of issues resulting from this. Um, the, the, the pallets haven't been planned correctly. Um, they haven't, the, the boxes, you can see that some of them are, are empty, so they're folding in on each, on each other and there's some crush, crushing happening. Um, and overall, we, we've got damage, uh, we've got poor utilization, and we've got poor quality of a product being shipped. So that is um, certainly an industry concern at the moment. Um, and if we, if we look, look behind at some of the processes or, or lack of processes that might result in a, an image like I just showed you, um, I think I would summarize the, the, the pain points that our, our, our customers are talking about in three areas and what they're trying to solve. So everyone knows about the, the opportunity to improve utilization and improve CBM, and everyone knows um, there'll be a, a massive cost potential saving with that. So CBM is, is a, big, a big opportunity and improving how um, inner cartons, outer cartons, pallets, containers are filled. Um, the second area is, is also quality. So, and, and that can be, uh, from a garment perspective, it can be around um, creasing. So Ralph Lauren have major issues with the amount of creasing they have in their, in their high quality products. So by the time the, the cartons get to, for example, they're shipped over to the US, they're having to be reworked. So they're having to be steamed or having to be um, you know, refolded, re redone, which of course increases touch points, increases time and cost in the supply chain. Um, similarly, from a, a general merchandise perspective, there's issues with quality. So it could be wine glasses, it could be fans, it could be uh, mirrors. So we've been talking with the, the warehouse group and, and they have challenges in those categories where there's a large amount of damage um, due uh, due to um, poorly packed um, cartons and then being moved through the supply chain. So those are three of the, the, the major areas, so CBM, quality. The, 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 the third one is um, the opportunity around sustainability. So the three go hand in hand. Um, obviously, if we can improve the utilization um, and if we can re uh, reduce damage and the need to move cartons back and forward and damage cartons back and forward in the supply chain, then we can help our sustainability uh, footprint. So those are the three, three major areas that we're, we're focusing on. Um, I think, so you can see uh, some of the pain points listed on that slide there. Um, one of the areas um, that we see, again, with, with even very large retailers is a lack of standards with their vendors and factories. So a lack of, lack of um, operating procedure, a lack of guidelines. Um, so, they really haven't spent the time um, perhaps educating or imposing or sharing or discussing best practice standards with their, with their suppliers and factories. Um, so um, there is a lack of um, documentation to, to underpin good process. So if we can talk about how um, some of the global retailers are, are tackling the concerns I've just raised, um, and, and, and some of the areas that there may be opportunities in, 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 your, in your categories and in your sectors. So 
you can see on there that the first the first area is is redesigning packaging to, to fit your supply chain so um, customers are, are looking for um, expertise in this area so uh, we actually do work with a, a partner called pack D who are self-confessed packaging geeks they are obsessed with um, beautifully designed you know perfectly fitting cost-effective cartons and ensuring that for uh, each category, the right kind of carton configuration is applied, the right carton design, the right, uh, the right actual uh, carton itself made from the, the right materials. Um, so that, that is the, um, the first area we, we can look at to improve. Um, so we, what other retailers are doing, apart from uh, spending the time to actually focus on the right packaging design, they're also working very, very closely at origin, uh, wherever the origin is, to work with vendors and factories to help educate them. And, and, and so you can design the best possible um, carton configuration for your items, but in order to actually implement that and hold the, the vendors and factories hands as they implement the new procedures, um, retailers are working with um, um, their vendors and factories at origin and spending the time to introduce new, new practice. Um, they also need to manage the compliance. So, you can spend the time designing the packaging, you can spend the time working in pilots, or working in trials with vendors and factories to try to implement the new standards, but you also need to manage the compliance and, and have some comfort that the standards that you've uh, set then get followed by your suppliers and factories. Um, and there is technology available that can help that. So we, we have a packaging compliance module, which I'll just briefly touch on later, which can help enforce um, the standards that you've defined uh, with your uh, suppliers and factories. So, um, so what, um, what our customers are looking for, they're looking for a, a combined offering of both uh, the ability to, to look at um, cartons and, and standards and design and look at, look at the, the carton, cartons uh, configurations currently in use. And they're also looking for a technology solution to help enforce compliance and, in, and, uh, in, and, and, and actually monitor the standards. So, so, so Pack D is, a, uh, is a, a packaging specialist company that um, has um, designers uh, based in, in Asia and they will help with a, a discovery and evaluation uh, stage. So just, just for example, we're, we're going through this exercise with the, the warehouse group, uh, the, one of the largest retailers in New Zealand at the moment. And, um, We've been looking at like half a dozen different styles. It could be a lady's dress. As I said earlier, it could be wine glasses. Uh, it could be electric fans. So any, any, any soft line or hard line products where there's issues uh, with the packaging, um, that the packaging specialist will take a look at some example um, cartons and will then offer um, analysis and suggestions on how to improve the, the packaging. Um, and actually the results are really quite, quite compelling and quite interesting. Um, you know, even though these products have been ordered for years and years and years from similar suppliers and factories, there's still a lot of opportunity to uh, improve, make improvements. So as you can see there, so the Pack D will help with the, the supplier um, relationships. So they'll help um, with the designs, they'll help with training, they'll work on site um, uh, at the supplier and factory locations um, to actually help um, hands-on go through the the, the carton redesign process and they'll, they'll then generate or produce specifications and SOPs uh, off the back of that analysis to help uh, uh, implement new procedures. From a, from a technology pers perspective um, we have technology which can help then enforce the compliance so there's a process in the, te in, in the, in the solution where a vendor will need to log into the solution and then confirm how they have packed the a given item or style. So have they followed the uh, procedures and the specifications from the retailer? Um, if not, there's an escalation and exception process in the system which will allow them to suggest a, a different carton configuration. Um, our, our solution also has um, a, a vendor portal uh, where there's online documentation, online videos which can be viewed and shared to help explain in, in a lot of detail how cartons should be loaded, how pallets should be built up, et cetera, et cetera. And 
from a, a technology perspective, um, you know, this this actually works alongside other other modules that we have available that, that Tim talked about earlier in the in the presentation. So it's one of our modules we have alongside a broader supply chain visibility and order management solution that's available. So just really briefly, if you if you haven't worked with you know, packaging compliance technology before, just a really, really quick snapshot of how this works. So we're getting all parties onto one web-based platform. We're removing emails and spreadsheets or ha you know, forms that have declared how um, a, 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 a given item has been loaded. And we're getting all participants onto a, a web platform in one place. So on the left-hand side there, a vendor would log into the system and then be met with a, a workflow explaining how many lines they needed to confirm how they had packed the product. Um, and there's a, as I said earlier, there's also a, uh, a circular escalation uh, process built in if they want to suggest a, a different carton configuration. So they can pick from a approved carton type where, uh, for example, if a retailer has spent the time and standardized cartons, and has a, start, a, a standard carton tariff, the vendors can pick from a, a standard tariff. They can also have the ability to suggest a, an alternative carton that's also compliant, um, so also fits the retailer's supply chain and destination uh, processing requirements, or they can suggest a, a custom carton type and introduce a new carton type into, into the retailer's supply chain. So they can do that through the system as well. And then if they do suggest a, a custom carton type, either the, the, the pa our packaging specialist Pack D or the retailer's uh, packaging team can choose whether to you know, view and approve and accept that new carton type into the, into the supply chain. So that's a little bit of how, how technology helps support um, the, the carton compliance and, uh, and monitoring process. So um, I've got some specific figures from, from, from M&S and a specific case study that I'll, I'll run through really quickly for you all. Um, but uh, you know, taking a, a broad sample across other customers we've worked with, I showed earlier in the, in the presentation, these figures are, are, are actually fairly, you know, fairly representative. So we just do see a huge uh, opportunity to increase the, um, or reduce the amount of air in cartons or on pallets or in containers. Um, definitely an opportunity to reduce damage as well. Um, and of course, that has knock-on no, knock benefits in terms of reducing your freight costs or your transportation costs. And uh, of course, there's, there's other softer benefits that perhaps aren't so easy to put a dollar figure or percentage figure against. But you know, by looking at the, um, at, the, at the supply chain in, in entirety and trying to reduce the amount of cartons, um, you know, fed through the supply chain, there's other benefits around, uh, obviously, sustainability, um, obviously, um, um, standardization, and, um, and, and, reducing, um, uh, yeah, and reducing the overall uh, packaging material in the, in the supply chain. So I'll just finish the, um, the packaging part by picking up a quick a case study from Marks & Spencer, who's one of our, our, one of our customers. So Stephen Jarman was he was tasked to implement standardization in the in the m s supply chain. So before he he embarked on this journey, uh, m s had very, very little control at all over their cartons. So they were relying on vendors and factories to effectively select the best carton or most cost effective carton to use in their supply chain. That led with that led to up to three thousand eight hundred different carton types, which is a, a huge a huge variety of cartons. That was no longer sustainable because m and were introducing automation in their destination warehouses. They needed standard dimensions that could, uh, be, that, that could uh, suit the racking um, automation, automated format, and it could also be stored correctly. So it was no longer sustainable. So they had to then emb embark on a journey of standardizing cartons, introducing standard carton tariffs, and having their, their vendors um, declaring um, exactly which cartons they were going to be using for each of their product types. So they used uh, technology to help do that. Um, they introduced the process where uh, vendors needed to log into uh, actually our system, 
and then confirm before they ship exactly how they have, have packed the, the product. So um, that actually, uh, you can see some of the benefits down the bottom. That process I talked about uh, of, of having a, a quite user-friendly system where the information is available to have the vendors confirm, um, that, that process of having them confirm uh, went from being seven, like went to being three days or more than three working days from a manual process to just a few minutes from technology. And M&S were then really able to reduce their, their um, really, really able to improve their utilization significantly. So you can see on the figures there, they took around a thousand containers less uh, per year out of their supply chain and they improve, improved their container utilization. It was from around 80% to about 95%. So really dramatic improvement in, the, in, in, in that. Okay. So if, if there are any carton geeks uh, watching this webinar, so if you recall the, the previous horror, horror picture, uh, this is um, what uh, Stephen Jarman would, would call carton porn, I think was the phrase he used. So beautifully packed um, um, cartons. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish off um, the, the presentation with, with the, the final part around ethical trade. So similarly, um, talking about some of the, the challenges that um, our, our customers are, are still facing around ethical trade. So you'll recall the, the slide where clearly consumers are wanting to know more and more um, about where uh, uh, products are made and how they're made and are they made in an ethical way. So I've summarized the challenges that we see across our customer base here into four major areas. So customers are wanting to ensure sorry our, our retailers are wanting to ensure that they choose the right initial sources so the right initial suppliers and factories. They're wanting to you know, protect their brand, so to ensure they, they are finding reliable um, sources. They want to improve uh, product quality and standards as well. They, they're increasingly treating their overseas uh, suppliers and factory as an extension of their workforce. So they really feel they have a, an ethical and um, you know, a principled need to raise standards in the factories. And they are, you know, recording and they are um, auditing the, the, the factories in, in very systematic ways. So they're ensuring that formal professional audits are done on factories before you know, an order is raised against the factory and they're recording the audit results in the system and sharing that information with their suppliers and factories to bring on the, the performance. So um, they also uh, you know, are finding they need to uh, improve the communication uh, between themselves and their suppliers and agents and factories. Um, so there's, a, there's an opportunity to collaborate online to improve the communication. And they're also wanting to monitor and measure um, the results of their ethical trade policies. So, um, so Sorry, there's a delay there. So, so just to quickly uh, touch on each of those four points. So from an onboarding process, we're finding um, more and more of our retailers uh, you know, are insisting on a, a very rigid formal onboarding process. So before they trade with a, a given new supplier or factory, they're having to walk the, the supplier through a formal process of uh, declaring their address, declaring uh, high level business information about the factory, how many workers they have, um, um, which factories they use, all of this upfront. Um, and um, we've, some of our customers have chosen to use a, a system uh, onboarding process to help you know, monitor and measure and take, um, take, take a new supplier or factory through a, a set of milestones in the, in the system. From an auditing perspective, we're finding that there are multiple audit bodies out there in, in, the, in, in the industry that can be used. Um, so SEDEX is a, a good example. Um, but we find um, uh, customers, and, and Lego is another recent example that uses our, our system. They need a, a neutral uh, independent platform where they can record uh, factory audit results in one place, and then including corrective actions that get picked up during an audit, have those stored in the system and have them fed back uh, through to their suppliers and factories uh, through an online platform so they can be shared. So here's an example of um, the factory audit results being stored in the system with a risk rating and then um, a number of corrective actions being listed and recorded uh, off the back of the, the factory audit that was done. 
Um, we're also just seeing through through the end-to-end -end supply chain. So with the audit information in the system, so with supplier details in the system and with factory details in the system together with the audit information, we're finding uh, retailers are, are wanting to then uh, build, build in blocks or, or checks in their end-to-end -end supply chain where they can reconfirm exactly which factory has been used um, you know, to actually make the product. Um, there's a, a long list there of end-to-end -end supply chain milestones. Um, but yeah, we're, we're increasingly finding that, that retailers are going further left and wanting to know right up front, even before they engage and get a, a price from a, a supplier or factory, just exactly who's going to be used uh, and have they been audited to a, a fair standard. Uh, so, so we have different checkpoints in, in, the, in the system that can support the compliance. So, for example, we, could, we can build control where uh, a, a vendor can't enter a price in the system without the factory being um, audited. Um, we can build controls, like I mentioned earlier, around not ordering from a, a factory that hasn't been um, audited correctly, or a, a shipment booking at origin, or a, um, a pre-shipment inspection. Again, they can be flagged at these stages if, they, if a factory is not being uh, audited correctly. Okay, and then just the last point um, is around the monitor and measuring. So again, many of you will know uh, how people are uh, you know, investing now in, in data analytics and business intelligence. Um, and this is also a, a good area for that. So if you have uh, a lot of audit data in your, in your system across your, your sourcing bases, you can then model trends. So you can look at hotspots, look at, look at challenges, look at areas sourcing areas that have more challenges than others or look at individual factories or suppliers that are having more corrective action issues than others and start to map trends and monitor trends and i know board you know large retailer board board packs and board reports tend to include this sort of information now so i've uh, I've, I've used my 30 minutes i think almost exactly so uh, i will now hand back over to um uh, monique and the team thank you for your for listening thanks for your time thanks duncan um, and just very quickly, I can relate, and I'm sure most of us can, to some of the um, topics brought up in your presentation. Um, specifically, we're struggling with um, getting containers or proper use of containers, full use of containers from some of our suppliers, and that's a project we're working on at the moment. And with packaging waste, well, well with, yeah, with packaging waste, we spent probably 12 months and quite a bit of um, international travel to try and condense or make more dense our PC product coming out of our factories in China. Um, the net result of that was that we saved over a couple of years, hundreds of thousands of dollars in air freight costs because we'll bring these things in by air freight. So product density was extremely important. Um, and also we made we were able to make the carton smaller, thus save on the amount of cardboard being used. So there was a sort of a, a dual side to it. Um, we saved lots of money and we, um, you know, obviously had a obviously had an environmental advantage as well. Yeah. So thanks yeah. very much, Duncan. Yeah, uh, you're very welcome, Tim. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a, one particular comment. And uh, it, what, what I find interesting is, um, and, and Toshiba, I'm sure, is, is fairly far up the... Uh, the chain in terms of how advanced your analysis and processes are. Uh, I won't mention any any retailer names, but you'll be surprised, or maybe not surprised. Some have so such little control over their the carton selection, carton usage. It's, it's really a huge opportunity. Um, it's, yeah, so it's 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 a, it's a good discussion to have with uh, potential customers. Absolutely. Okay, so um, so while Duncan catches his breath, may I introduce? The other panel for today, or the other panel member, is um, Jane Paramore. Jane, could could I ask you just to introduce yourself um, and a bit of background on yourself, rather than <laughs> me read out what's been written here, because I think you'd probably be able to express it better verbally. Thanks very much. Sure, Tim, by all means, thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for having me, joining you this afternoon. It's a great opportunity to talk to the ASCII membership, um, so very pleased to be here. Um, my name is Jane Paramore. I am Sustainability Partnerships Manager at APCO, um, and that is uh, basically taking a sustainability lens to uh, the broader audience that we are looking to engage around groups like industry associations and, and uh, commun more community activity, more local government work, 
uh, things like that, I, I am uh, leading that charge with a, a sustainability focus on things. I come out of 15 years in the FMCG sector, working in analytical market research and putting a lot of products on shelves and, and getting them to the right consumers and uh, ended up coming out of that and moved into the sustainability space. So I spent a bit of time in um, corporate engagement around sustainability issues, working in areas like building and construction particularly, but more recently working in the plastics and plastics pollution space and uh, in this role with APCO looking at packaging more broadly. So I bring a very strange mix of, of experience to the, to, the, uh, to the table, but hopefully it's uh, the sort of stuff that we need to be making the right decisions in this space at the moment. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Um, so, Monique, are we in a position where we want to answer well answer questions now? Do you think? I noticed there was one question there. Yeah, of course. Please go ahead and um, ask some questions from the attendees. We've got seventy what seventy one members in on the webinar today, so. You must have some questions there that uh, you'd like to ask of, of Jane or, or Duncan. So, yeah, please, please go ahead. Um, Jane, perhaps maybe you have some questions for Duncan um, that you'd like to ask while um, some of the members are thinking. Yeah, Monique, sure. I, one thought did cross my mind. Um, very interesting seeing the work that um, Duncan's doing in this space and there's some incredible uh, shifts being and achievements being, uh, being put in place, which is, is really good to see. Um, I guess one of the things that strikes me is that a lot of the companies that are, are doing this are larger, probably more um, capable companies in terms of things like capacity and, and budget constraints. Uh, one of the things that we face as APCO is, is how do we encourage that same sort of supply chain engagement, which is one of the things that we absolutely believe underpins getting um, having success in these areas. Uh, how do we support those guys to, I guess, achieve that same sort of uh, impact that, that some of the bigger companies that have the more capacity to, to deliver on? Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a, a bit of a challenge for me to answer because um, I suppose I kind of implied in the in the intro about us that our our target markers market does tend to be tier one or tier two retailers and um, we yeah there's the the, the um, analysis that's done by Pack D we tend to do that as a um, it, 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 there's, there's still a cost obviously to engage the packaging engineers. Um, and have them provide the consulting advice and 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 um, and, 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 go and and steer. So there is a, a degree of budget needed to, uh, to do that. Um, what what we do offer though, in, in, in with with PACD is different um, um, commercial models. So we can look at things like win win or gain share scenarios, which can help a bit. So because the savings can be actually modelled quite quite quickly. Uh, obviously, again, there's many, many supply chain experts on this webinar. So you'll know, actually, it's not that difficult to, to look at existing utilization figures and how that translates through to transport budgets and spend, and then look at um, even how quite small benefits can make big, big cost savings. So I guess, frankly speaking, we, we do focus on the larger, the larger uh, potential retailers at the moment. Um, and there is a degree of, uh, complexity and expertise in this area, which I guess has, a, <laughs> has, a, has some cost to it. The, um, the, the, the technology itself um, that, we, that we implement is, is not uh, priced at like a, a, a tier one sort of level. So it's not that complex, the actual uh, the compliance technology itself. But I think the insight and intellect that, that goes into the redesign is, is, is quite specialist. So I think uh, there needs some budget for it. Um, I, I also, I just noticed one question on the, um, on the ethical trade side. Um, there was a question from Ali asking around uh, globally agreed definitions of ethics standards. Um, I just wanted to answer that for everybody. So in the UK especially, there's a, a body called uh, Ethical Trade Initiative or ETI, which is a, a co-regulated body, I assume similar to APCO. Um, and many, many retailers and brands have chosen to sign up to Ethical Trade Initiative. Um, and that offers standard um, questions and standard um, uh, definitions and, and standard uh, areas uh, to analyze a, a factory. So there'll be a, a list of questions around uh, worker, worker conditions, around 
uh, around technology, around the production facilities, around um, worker rights, a whole, whole list of uh, questions that, 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 that go with that. And that might be quite an interesting um, uh, resource point to look at if you're wanting to implement uh, new standards in your, in your, in your ethical sourcing. Um, I'm not sure if Australia has the, the same example because I've worked with retailers that have looked at the UK example and use that as a base a baseline or benchmark. So it might be something to look at the ETI initiative. So Jane, um, just Tim here, just a question for you. Um, are you seeing movement in on the ethics and compliance area amongst your organisation, APCO's membership? Yeah, Tim, we are. Um, there's a lot of, of pressures coming in, in, that, in from different directions in that respect. But I think probably the uh, the driver of the national packaging targets is is a huge motivator for businesses. And we've seen an enormous growth in our membership over the last 12, 18 months uh, as companies are, are realising that they, they need to do some work to, to deliver on those targets. Um, we're also seeing it from the point of view of you know, the conscious consumer movement, which we talk about millennials, but it's not just millennials. We're looking at a lot of older generation as well, who I think are probably not the ones that are doing the knitting for the grandchildren anymore, but they're concerned about things like packaging and the impact that it's having on the environment for their grandkids. I think there's a, a great motivator in that space as well. Um, so I think it's pushing a lot of decision making amongst, amongst um, industry that we are working very hard to try and navigate through sort of things around issues like material choices and avoiding plastics, but not necessarily going down a better path in, in terms of choosing alternative materials. So um, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of rhetoric in in the space, and we're also seeing a lot of um, concerted effort to make the right decisions, um, particularly amongst the membership. And you know that's our role is to tr try and help them navigate through all that that. Uh, Stuff that's coming into the marketplace to make sure that they're going in the right direction. So yeah, there's there's definitely a, a very much raised awareness around all, all these sorts of issues. Yeah, thanks, Jane. That, that's that's good. Um, I think Tim, just one other thing I might mention there is, uh, I, I, and again, I guess it goes back to um, helping the smaller um, players in the marketplace to to make these um, these changes in their businesses. Um, we're seeing, I think, the drive of a lot of the multinationals is having knock-on benefits because, of course, they can adopt new technologies and and um, I guess drive that economy of scale that then makes it a bit more accessible to to smaller players in the marketplace and and sets up those. I guess uh, those value chains that they can start to tap into and, and gain the benefits of, of that sort of development work that's being done at the higher end of town. So it's, it does have a very positive knock-on effect in that respect. Right, yeah, thanks Jane, that's a good point. Um, I've just seen another question come in uh, from Hoda around uh, Modern Slavery Act and, and, and how technology can potentially help, you know, drive, um, provide insights or, or provide um, uh, some support in that space. So I guess from you know, specifically from our, our, our perspective as, as EV Cargo Technology, so we don't do the audits themselves, but I think we can help a little bit in terms of ensuring that the information has been captured and things like um, supplier declarations have been made. So I, I suppose I'm thinking more about perhaps again mid-size or larger retailers that have many, many different sources. So if you have you know, 50 suppliers, 100 suppliers, maybe 300 suppliers, and you want to make sure that they've all read um, various acts and have, you know, agreed to, you know, confirm they've at least read the act and agreed to comply with them. You can use technology to you know, support that process very simply. So you can post the um, the act on the on the on a vendor portal and have vendors confirm that they you know, tick a box and confirm that they've read it and they agree with it. Um, also, from a, a, an audit perspective, so you know, auditors or third party auditors would look at these sort of areas as part of a standard audit. Um, you know, it can help to capture the results of the audit in one place. And as I said in, in, in my presentation, then link that back into your supply chain. So having a standalone database or standalone spreadsheet with all your factories, but not being able to link that with your actual supply chain, that actually is quite a challenge for quite a lot of our customers. So you know actually linking who you who you finally order from and who you ship from and which factories and you know having the confidence that they you know that that factory has at least been inspected or looked at that the systems can help in that place to link the audit results with your supply chain okay so can we have just one last question for duncan please Yeah, 
Is that it? All right, so we've reached the close time of today's webinar. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank our co-host Michael Page and to thank Duncan for joining us today. Um, don't forget, if you'd like to continue the discussion after the webinar, there'll be a post in our closed LinkedIn group for you to comment and share some key learnings from today. Um, let us know if you require CD, CPD points by typing CPD into the Q&A box, and I notice a lot of people have um, before you leave the webinar. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today and uh, stay safe now that it's exactly 2 p.m. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I I'm happy to stay around for a bit. <laughs>